We are Maria and Nicole. We're two secular homeschooling moms that have been, been there, there, done, done that. that. It's hard enough sometimes to fit in all the regular subjects of reading, writing, math, social studies, and science into a busy homeschool schedule. Add in all your electives and you might wonder if you even need to make time for health and physical fitness. Maybe your kids are already active in sports or dance classes. Perhaps a healthy diet is already a part of your lifestyle. If so, great, you're already one step ahead. In today's episode 51, we're going to be talking about how health and fitness are crucial components of a well-rounded education. We all get so busy and maybe you've let a few things go and your kids have been watching a lot of TV or playing video games a little more than you want them to, or you've been too busy for those evening family neighborhood walks like you really wanted to do and you're ready to incorporate a more healthier lifestyle. This episode is for you. We're going to be giving you tips on how to make these subjects happen in your homeschool. And we're also going to talk about sex education and the importance of teaching our children to make lifelong healthy habits. And as usual, we want to stress that our podcast is an inclusive space for your everyday parents that are looking for education options. We are not here to convince you to homeschool. Uh, We want to stress that you need to do what works for your child and for your family. Every family is different. Absolutely. And you know your children best. So uh, feel free to take what advice or information you get from here that works for you and chuck the rest. Good morning, Nicole. (gasps) Good morning, Maria. How's it going? It's going great. The Cowboys played yesterday, but don't tell me the score because I am waiting. I recorded it. I'm going to watch it with my friend Jennifer. Oh my gosh, that's okay because I didn't even know they played. Um, (laughs) You know, I'm not a sports baller necessarily, though football's been on nonstop at my house. Like my husband, I was like, do you not watch shows anymore? I don't remember football being like every day. Oh my gosh, did you watch the OU Texas game? A little bit, a little bit. That one gives me a little trauma because of all the years that we performed at the state fair on that weekend oh <laughs> which is like crazy it it's was a crazy on a game. Saturday anyway. it was a and I'm not I don't really watch a lot of college football but that game was probably one of the best games I've ever seen I don't know it was crazy it started with an interception like the very first play. oh really it oh was nuts goodness. yeah well my favorite thing about that game is whoever is the person that writes the highway signs out on the text <laughs> text DOT Department of Transportation yeah. they always have the most clever signs for like football weekends and they were talking <laughs> about how you know get there safer not sooner it was so funny. They always have just really clever ones, but I got to see those on my way back from camping. That's where we've been for the last few days. Oh, the weather was perfect for oh it. Oh gosh, it was just what I needed. I love to wake up in a tent and it's 40 degrees. But and you it's... had a burn ban, didn't you? We did. So we couldn't have a fire, but it was okay because it was it was just cold enough for sleeping and then it was totally fine during the day. We did a whole candle fire thing instead and it was it oh, was cute. Oh, that's clever. But guess what? What? My breakdown was super easy because I threw my tent away. What did it break? What happened? Well, it breaks every time I go camping. And every time I go, <laughs> I'm like, I'll fix this before the next time. And then I come home and I put my tent away. This and time I forget. You said no. This time I said no. And so I got there at night <laughs> setting up my tent in the dark and I realized that last time we had been there, all of the things that like anchored the tent had broken. So I had to actually drive my stakes into the tent itself. Which, oh. like, rendered it not waterproof anymore. It's, like, a mess. Okay, it looks like you're on the hunt for a new tent. Well, I already ordered one, and it came oh. yesterday, and the technology has totally changed, and it's a 60-second setup. No. Yep. Does that mean there's proprietary poles, so if one thing breaks, you have to throw the whole thing away? Probably, but I bought it for $78, so <laughs> I'll get a new tent every time. How many people um, sleep? Well, you know how that is, so it says six, so two comfortably. Two. <laughs> It's true. It's true. Especially you because you put out your bed and then you have your nightstands. Yeah. We also got little tent cots and I slept like the best I've ever slept. So oh, wow. was, I know. So I'm, I'm raring to go. Let's like, let's get our group to go camping again soon. I would love that. Yeah. We talked about it. that, but we haven't done it. Yeah. We're busy. Yeah. We're busy with other I know, things. We are. So speaking of busy, let's get into our episode. You know, fitness tends to be an easier subject for both of us to talk about. We're both active. We've mentioned several times that we're lifelong athletes. Uh, We're both involved in sports and different kinds of things. And naturally, we've encouraged our kids to also be active as well. And for many kids, this is natural, especially when they're young. Kids love to play. But not all kids enjoy being super active. And as they get older, this may become even more true. Yeah, that's true. And promoting healthy habits from an early age instills lifelong habits. 
And this doesn't just create healthier bodies and reduce their risk for chronic diseases, but it also ensures an overall well-being in their life. Yeah, physical education is important because it fosters social skills, teamwork, discipline. It also provides an outlet for physical energy and helps combat sedentary lifestyles, which are becoming increasingly prevalent in today's digital age. Oh, that's true. Physical education has never been more important. Even before COVID, inactivity was on the rise in a major Mm -hmm. way. Kids around the world are really suffering from inactivity. One of the best things about homeschooling is that we're not tied to a desk all day long. Right. We have the freedom to move around, take breaks when we want. And regular movement has been proven to help kids stay focused and improve cognitive function. Uh, We're not really big on testing, either of us, especially in the younger years. But studies have shown time and time again that students do perform better on tests with regular physical activity. That's true. So how do we include physical education and fitness into our day? Well, a lot of us have memories of PE class in school. And for kids that are not into sports, this is a really great option. Some homeschool families do use a structured PE PE curriculum or program designed just for homeschoolers. And these resources often include lesson plans, fitness activities, and assessments. And these can be self-taught or sometimes you can find an actual class locally. Yeah, there's a group here in DFW that I know runs PE programs in several cities. Oh, I don't yeah. Know, that yeah, Bo- we've actually part- sports, yeah, we've actually participated in two of those programs over the years. They do drills, they do flag football and a bunch of other games. And it's great to get the kids out in groups while somebody else organizes the activity. I right. Like <laughs> I think I told you guys in another episode, though, the time that my park district decided to do an inaugural homeschool class. And uh, we all showed up and they were like, we're going to start with dodgeball. And all the kids like looked around and they were like, this is a game all kids know how to play. It's all homeschoolers. None of the homeschoolers knew how to play? No, because how do you play dodgeball if you're like an only child? (laughs) Or if there's just two of you, like you know, like. Well, we did that. You remember that one year where we were at the trampoline park and they did trampoline dodgeball. That was intense. Yeah. I mean, that that was was a cool place. I I played. I was taking out some kids. It was awesome. Me too. I was like, you can hit your own kid in the head with the dodgeball, but everybody else below the neck. (laughs) Okay, moving on. Another way that you can incorporate physical activity into your homeschool is to make physical activity a daily routine. You can set aside time for activities like stretching or yoga or calisthenics or even have a dance party in your living room. I love a dance party in the living room. To the wiggles. We used to say, like, try and do a whole wiggle song. You'll run out of steam. You can also take advantage of our awesome freebie this week. Uh, Maria created this awesome homeschool fitness dice, and you can print them on cardstock and cut them out to create these fun dice that you roll them and then you do the movement that the dice says. You can also make your own custom activity page with the dice. She made some cool blank ones. And you can use online videos or apps that offer guided workouts suitable for all ages. When my kids were younger, we liked yoga for kids videos. We also took a lot of walks. I know you guys went to the gym a lot as well. We did. My son and I did CrossFit together um, in high school. My daughter often goes to the rec center with me to work out. Oh, yeah. Another way that you can bring physical activity into your homeschool is to encourage outdoor playtime for younger children especially activities like running biking playing tag or sports in the backyard with siblings or friends or climbing the jungle gym at a park are great ways to keep kids active oh yeah i love to be outside you can also enroll your child in sports leagues or recreation programs Um, many communities offer homeschool friendly sports teams swimming lessons martial arts dance soccer you know pretty much like here in dfw anything yes that's for sure over the years my kids have done a lot of rec teams. They did tennis, they did soccer, baseball, they did fencing. They've also done some swimming classes and they're both black belts in Taekwondo. That really wasn't a homeschool class. That was an after school, but you know, we like the instructor. I talked recently on an episode about always taking my kids with me to my adult softball games and they would bring their scooters and run around with all the other kids and we all got exercise. I call that a win. Yeah, we used to, John and I used to take the kids to the track on Sundays. That was our big thing. We loved doing track I workouts you doing that yeah and it's cool because you can either stick the kids in the middle of the track while you're doing stuff or we would sometimes bring bikes and stuff if they were uh, if there weren't a lot of other people there and let them kind of ride them around on there it was a great family ritual yeah that's a great idea you can also create a home gym and you don't need anything special you can do this with basic equipment like jump ropes resistant bands dumbbells or a yoga ball and the best part about having a home gym is that it's always open and so it's easy to walk over and incorporate that into your homeschool day. 
Yeah, and we've made a home gym mostly out of items that I've gotten for free or low cost off next door marketplace. You can look for a lot of this stuff in the spring um, from the re- resolutionists <laughs> when they've <laughs> given up on their New Year's uh, resolution. And we've talked before about things like exercise dice, which uh, you've made the freebie for this week. Exactly. I've gotten a lot of stuff off Facebook Marketplace for dirt cheap, and it's always a couple months after the new year when people gave up on those resolutions. You can also include the whole family in physical activities. You can do family hikes. We've talked on many episodes about your homeschool hike group, which is a great way to socialize and get physical activity. You can ride bikes or play games that are active together as a family. You can even go for a family walk around your neighborhood. I mentioned that earlier after dinner. You can just make it a habit after dinner. We all go for a walk. You don't have to go very far and it doesn't have to take your entire evening. And this will really foster a culture of fitness within your home. Yeah, you can also plan educational field trips to places like museums or nature reserves or science centers that offer interactive exhibits that are related to health, anatomy, and physical fitness. Uh, We love the Perot Science Center downtown. It has this basement sports uh, exhibit. It's a permanent exhibit, and you can race, like, different animals, like, like, on a little track. Yeah, a T-Rex or, like, a (laughs) cheetah. There's also, like, a room something where it measures your like jump or it does a slow-mo vi- oh, video oh that's what you. it is yeah because yeah, you can do different things you could do a cartwheel or you could do a jump shot or different things everybody loves that section of the museum we also love the parks that have exercise stations ran into one on a hike one time it was kind of like a pneumatic they had oh yeah bench press and yeah everything. all kinds of different things and some of them over in grapevine they put together these like, setups and they're great they've got pull down and uh pull-up bars and just all kinds of different things all in one spot. So pretty kids, cool. kids are naturally drawn to those too. That's true. You can also create physical challenges or fitness goals that align with your child's interests. For example, they can aim to run a mile without stopping or do 20 push-ups without stopping or go a certain distance on a bike. Here in Dallas, we have a lake called White Rock Lake. It's about nine miles around the entire perimeter. I remember when I took my kids for the first time to do the entire lake. I used to ride with my little guy on my bike on his seat, but I'm Mm. like, okay, this is the first time we're all going to do it. And we knew that once we made it halfway, we couldn't turn around because we were already 50%. <laughs> You're already there. My youngest was nine years old at the time. And I, I really did feel a little bit bad because his wheels were like half the size as mine. So he had to work twice as hard. <laughs> but I tell you, he did it. He was so empowered. He was so happy and proud of himself. We stopped a couple times for a snack and break, but he did it. We did it. It took about an hour. I was oh, so yeah. proud of him. It's a lot of fun. I That's a great area. <laughs> Remember, I almost died because I went there with like an old lady hiking group and I didn't know that they were like super fast and they all like took off. And oh my I, gosh, I remember that. <laughs> I was like, what? I'm like super fit. I'm like, I, I guess I'm not a fast hiker. I don't know. But we go there often. <laughs> We've also kayaked and paddleboarded there as a group. There's a lot of fun stuff. You can also try and throw together a field day with other friends and do little competitions and sports games. I still have like a flag football set and some of those outdoor games like the what's the thing that's like a little mini trampoline slam ball or oh yeah spike ball or something yeah you know all of those cornhole even like all of those fun activities just get you moving and they're they're a good time yeah and also on this competition topic I I remember when I got the kids Fitbits for Christmas oh yeah and we're all running literally running around the house everybody's trying to get their steps and I had a whiteboard I have a whiteboard in my homeschool room the kids all day long they kept going and competing yeah. with me I got now now we're like that with our like apple watches we are, oh, and we like to try and I'm um, only at 7,000 so far today what are you at 7,000 steps, um, steps. I well steps. I walked four miles this morning already so um, I am probably all right I'm at 11 uh, okay 11 9 <laughs> yeah but I'm done for the day I've done my workout and that um, but yeah, we and we think it's funny to send, you know, it'll tell you to send little messages of encouragement. And they're always really funny. <laughs> yeah, so it's like we start doing that all the time. <laughs> But yeah, um, (laughs) we're off on a tangent today. You can also encourage your child to keep a health journal where maybe they record daily physical activities, meals, reflections on their overall well-being. Journaling is such a popular thing, I feel like, for like every subject. Um, But this can be a useful tool for tracking progress and setting goals. Jillian is in that frameworks class at Dallas College, and they are doing like a 30-day challenge that they have to journal every day. (laughs) Different things in there. It is an interesting class. Yeah. I'm glad she's taking that one. Me too. When 
each of my kids were 13, I got them gym memberships and taught them how to lift weights properly. And I got this great book for them to log each workout. I'll link it in the show notes, but it really helped to keep them on track and motivated. And they always like to do their sets. And then the next week they would come back and like, I can do, you know, five more pounds on each arm. Oh, so, awesome. Yeah, yeah it was yeah. good. It's great. Remember that fostering a lifelong love of physical activity and healthy living is really just the primary goal. Like you can tailor your approach to your child's interests and your needs and, you know, do what works for your family, but just make PE health and fitness part of each day. And be sure to make it an enjoyable part. And that doesn't mean that they don't work hard, but you want to give them attainable goals and help them feel accomplished and empowered. Yeah. So just a reminder that this is a weekly episode. We drop one every Thursday morning just for you. And if you have any additional ideas or comments, please come and comment on our Facebook page on the episode thread or send us an email at info at btdthomeschool.com. We'd really love to hear from you. So how do I teach health? Well, teaching health to your child can be both educational and fun. There are so many great resources available that cover a wide range of health topics and cater to different age groups. And it's easy to integrate health education into your homeschool curriculum. You'll want to cover topics like nutrition, hygiene, anatomy, and the importance of a balanced lifestyle. You can also involve your child in meal planning and preparation. You can talk about healthy food choices, cooking techniques, portion control. Gardening can also be a fun way to learn about growing and harvesting fresh produce. Oh, yeah. We love our garden. Yeah. I kind of feel like most homeschoolers already do this. Maybe they don't all garden, but I think most homeschoolers teach the foundations of healthy lifestyle because we're always cooking and cleaning. So naturally, the kids are always there, part of it all. they're already in the kitchen. And if you work solo in the kitchen and you send them away to go play when it's time to cook, I would really encourage you to bring them to the kitchen and teach them now because let me tell you, it's awesome to walk into the door and your teenager just cooked dinner. We started when they were very young, when they were toddlers, climbing up in their learning tower and helping to tear lettuce for a salad. And if you feel lost on where to start, there really are a ton of resources available. You can use textbooks and online resources and educational videos to teach these subjects. We'll talk about a few of these options, but we'll have a ton of resources in our show notes. So be sure to check that out too. Yeah, one great free resource is Khan Academy. I know a lot of people think of Khan Academy for like math and science, but they also have free online courses on health and medicine. And those cover a variety of topics suitable for middle and high school students. There's also a online resource called Kids Health in the Classroom, and it's a website that provides lesson plans, activities, videos on health topics, including nutrition, exercise, and emotional well-being. Yeah, and some people want to go totally old-style school textbook on this topic, and if you're one of those, here are two popular textbook options. There's Holt Lifetime Health, and this is a comprehensive health textbook for middle and high schoolers, and then there's also Glencoe Health, and that's another widely used textbook a lot of people enjoy. Those are both publishers you probably recognize from when you were in school. There's also tons of documentaries and educational videos. I guess instead of doing my documentaries and donuts morning, you could do documentaries and carrots. (laughs) My kids would not come down for that. So yeah, maybe we'll do a donut. Super Size Me, that was a documentary that explored the impact of fast food on health Mm -hmm. or Food Incorporated. That's an eye-opening documentary about the food industry and its effects on health. Now, I will caution with documentaries like this that you really do need to consider the source. There's a lot of really one-sided kind of ones out there. And then you'll see people quoting these on like diet websites. And then there's always somebody will point out like, well, that's all cherry picked data. And they'll offer the total other perspective. So maybe watch both and use those things as a learning opportunity. You talk about critical thinking in there too. Yeah, that's a good point. There's also TED Ed Health Lessons. And TED Ed offers a range of health related lessons and videos for all ages. I know a lot of people don't think about TED Ed for this, but they yeah. have a lot of really great resources. So much stuff out there. Um, there's also some really cool health and anatomy apps out there. I found when we were kind of researching this episode, Human Anatomy Atlas is an interactive app that provides detailed 3D models of the human body. Like my kids would have loved that when they were younger. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And then My Plate by Livestrong, that's a nutrition and calorie tracking app. And you can learn about healthy eating habits that way. Yeah. And I really like my fitness pal. Yeah, I do I too. use that myself. Yeah. 
And there's a lot of websites that are really great for this. There's the CDC's BAM, which is called the Body and Mind. And that offers a website with interactive games and quizzes and information about health and safety. There's also Medline Plus, which is a comprehensive resource from the National Institute of Health. And that covers a wide range of health topics. They also have articles and videos and tutorials that you can go through there. Yeah, teaching basic first aid is also an important aspect of health education. You can consider purchasing or assembling. It's kind of fun to assemble a first aid kit, put all the pieces together, and then teaching your child how to use it. Yeah, and you can also teach safety and emergency preparedness. Years ago, the kids and I put together a bin with essentials. As we were preparing to record this episode, I actually went to my closet and I pulled down that bin so I could list exactly what we have in there. I did, and there's uh, a first aid kit a flashlight, batteries, a blanket, one of those like solar blankets, ponchos, a towel, two life straws. I got those on a really big sale. I don't on know what a li- what's a life straw. That's whenever you have contaminated water. Oh, like it's a filter. Instead of iodining it. Yeah, oh, you can nice. just drink from it. Yeah. Oh, I need to get some of it those. It filters it straight up. And there's duct tape, freeze dried food, string, a phone charger, masks and water. I also included reading glasses because that is an essential for me. (laughs) Oh my gosh, that's so funny. Yeah, if you want to create one of these with your kids, you can use safety manuals and guides available from organizations like the American Red Cross, or you can contact your local health department, see about resources, workshops, and educational programs that they might offer for homeschoolers. Yeah, and years ago in our Adventure Kids Club, we did a first aid CPR class at your house with an instructor. We also did another one with our scout troop at one of those standalone ERs. And then you remember when we co-taught the survival <laughs> class in co-op? Who can forget that? Yeah, that was with the younger kids, maybe 7 to 10 years old. Yeah. And we covered a lot of these skills in a really fun way. But do you remember that one kid <laughs> that shared their survival story? And they had everybody's attention. But then the story started that they were dying of thirst at Costco <laughs> until they came to the end cap of the aisle. And then they got a sample of coconut water. It saved their lives. They were so... They <laughs> that were was the die. funniest class <laughs> Those kids were so cute. We always encouraged them to tell their stories to us, and they were always funny. (laughs) Always. And of course, you know, we love our books. We're going to have a bunch of great ones listed on our show notes, but you can also visit your local library and find all kinds of titles or just explore the health and wellness section for books suitable for your child's age. We found it handy to get a lot of books about various subjects and kind of keep them with an easy access on our shelves. One book we really liked was The Body Book, Easy to Make Hands-On Models. It's a scholastic publication, and you end up going through all the different body parts and you make an entire skeleton like out of paper. Like sometimes they'll include those little uh, brass, you know, brass things that you can make movable parts. I mean, they're super fun. So we would use that as a spine. And then we got other books and resources and read those about like, you know, read about the lungs and then you make a scale model of a lung. We also shared a free skeleton that you can build on our Freebies Facebook group. Uh, we now have a whole area devoted on our website for those resources that we find. Uh, Maria's 16 year old made that skeleton the other day. <laughs> yes, he did. It was actually really fun. And it's now a Halloween decoration. I love it. And when teaching health, you need to be sure to tailor the materials and resources to your child's age, their interests, and their maturity level. You want to encourage open discussions about health-related topics and answer their questions honestly. You really want to create a supportive and informative learning environment. We will include some of the links and ideas and everything that we're talking about on our show notes on our website, so be sure to check that out after you listen. I'm going to have some great free resources for this episode, so sign up for our newsletter so you don't miss out. Okay, moving on to sex education. So how do I even begin talking to my child about sex ed? Well, sexual education is essential for empowering your child with accurate information about their bodies, relationships, and safe practices. This is going to enable them to make informed decisions and navigate the complexities of sexuality and relationships responsibly. These subjects collectively contribute to the holistic development of homeschooled children, and it's so important to equip them with essential life skills for a healthy and fulfilling future. Oh, absolutely. And keep in mind that it's completely normal for children to worry about their bodies, especially when things start changing during puberty. Reassure them and always remember that you are their role model and your words and actions set an example. The way you talk about sexuality sends messages that last a lifetime. These conversations aren't just about sharing information. You're teaching values and attitudes. How you talk is one of the first lessons they receive about body image and sexuality. 
Right. And talking about sex and puberty isn't just a one-time conversation. Young kids are curious and they have a lot of questions. And being open to these questions without judgment shows them that you are a source of support and that they can come to you and ask you anything. Help them create a healthy body image by the way that you talk about your own body and others. Encourage other healthy habits too, like we were talking about. Exercise, diet, good personal hygiene, posture, healthy sleep habits, and stress relief. And I would really encourage you to be proactive on this. Don't wait for them to come to you with questions about their changing body. You really want to create a safe space for them to ask questions without shame or fear. Let them know that you're available to talk, but also start conversations too. Discuss puberty and the feelings that come with its changes as openly as possible. And I know some parents might feel embarrassed discussing these sensitive topics, but kids are often relieved to have them take the lead. And I guarantee if you don't teach these extremely valuable lessons, they're going to learn somewhere else. And there's a good chance that these other sources might not even be accurate information. Yeah, you don't. One of the benefits of homeschooling is that they're not going to learn that in a locker room or on the playground. <laughs> Yeah. They can learn it from you. Well, they might learn on the playground, but you're right there to explain. Exactly. And <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Talk to them about the changes their bodies will go through as they grow. Some girls start puberty at eight years old now, and some boys do by nine. So you may need to start these talks earlier than you think. Mm-hmm. Discuss the physical and emotional changes that come with puberty before they begin. And we put together a great list of books to help guide you during this entire process. The first one is It's So Barely Noticeable by Robbie Harris and Michael Amberley. And it's a book for ages about six to 10 years old. And it's a really hilarious book made for pre-tweens, but still it's really good for middle school children too. This is mostly a basics book, but it addresses different kinds of love. It, It addresses relationships and different expressions and showing of love. Another one is Where Did I Come From? And it's for ages six plus. This is another good book teaching the basics with accurate illustrations. It's a higher level of information provided to elementary kids, but it answers all the right questions and it teaches anatomy presented in picture book form. So you can, you know, read that with them. Yeah, that's a good one. And there's also What's Happening to Me? And that's for like that middle age, like nine to 12 years old. And it uses humor, honesty, and sympathy. And it really grabs the attention of kids but it can ease the embarrassment for both kids and parents. That book does a really good job on that one. Yeah. Another one is It's So Amazing. This one's for maybe seven and up. Helps answer questions younger kids have about reproduction, babies, love, sex, and gender. Provides honest answers with age-appropriate, reassuring words and accurate, inclusive art, which that's nice. Yeah. And then there's also What's Happening to My Body. And that's for a little bit older, like the 11 to 15-year-old range. And this book is made for boys and it touches on all those bases it includes like steroids and acne diet and exercise and romantic feelings voice changes and more it's straightforward and it also touches on what puberty is for girls a good way to introduce a book like this is you should probably read it first then present the book to your child and then once they're finished you can come to them and discuss and answer questions that anything that they might have Yeah, that's sometimes I just like gave my kids a stack of books. And I was like, I know that this is embarrassing. So if you want to go just read these on your own, and then, you know, come back. What's happening to my body is another one. It's also like 11 to 15. This is a book for girls. It touches on all the bases, including breast development, reproduction, menstruation, um, growth and growth spurts, body hair, diet and exercise, romantic and sexual feelings, and more. It uses a straightforward writing style, and it touches on what puberty is for boys. Again, you should read this one first, then present the book and answer questions later. You know, I actually had my kids read complete books for both genders. I did too. Yeah, I I thought it was really important whether they're boy and they're reading about, you know, menstruation or, you know, other girls and reading about other things. So I think it's really important for them to have a full knowledge of both genders. Right. The next book on the list is It's Perfectly Normal. And that's for a little bit older. It's for ages 10 plus. Uh, This series really does not dumb anything down. And it's one of my favorite series, actually. It's one of the reasons I love it is because it really does answer questions appropriately and and accurately and it's a no-nonsense book and it's a thorough guide to changing bodies growing up sex and sexual health and it does a great job it covers all those bases including those embarrassing things that happen to all their bodies and it also includes a chapter on internet safety which is really good and yeah we're going to be talking we're going to have an episode coming up uh, talking about internet safety and the illustrations are for older kids so keep that in mind but it really is a must read for middle schoolers 
Yeah. Another book is Consent, The New Rules of Sex Education. Now, this one is for 15 and up. It's really for older middle schoolers, high schoolers. I mean, it covers an overview of human sexuality, common scenarios, healthy ways to handle them. It gives tools for communicating and understanding consent and abuse. Um, again, read it and present it and answer questions. Uh, we talked about consent in another one of our high school episodes and had a couple links there that were really good, too, that I would yeah. incorporate with a book like this and the ebook I made it's all about teen healthy relationships yeah. and about red flags and green flags and talking about how to handle some of those situations yeah so, those and are, it's free if you guys want to yeah. grab that we'll include it in the show notes yeah there's also one called let's talk about body boundaries consent and respect and that's by Janine Sanders or um, I said no a kid to kid guide to keeping private parts private that's a one that would be better for younger kiddos yeah and then moving on, the next one is The Care and Keeping of You by Valerie Schaefer. This series is particularly useful for girls and covers puberty and personal hygiene topics. And then there's also Sex is a Funny Word by Corey Silverberg. And this book is aimed at kids aged probably eight and older and explores topics like bodies, gender, and relationships in a way that is inclusive and affirming. And lastly, Cycle Savvy for Teens is by Toni Weschler, and you might remember her as the author of Taking Charge of Your Fertility, which I think probably a lot of us read Oh yeah. Um, as, as adults trying to get pregnant. We always joked about how it would be great if there was a book like that for teens, because we kind of learned more as adults when that might have been handier to know from the beginning. It's really the first book specifically designed to teach young women about the practical benefits of charting their cycles and ovulation and fertility and why you even have periods at all. It's a great, great book. Yeah, that's a great author. There are also a number of progressive sex education resources online that prioritize comprehensive, inclusive information. And these resources promote open and informed discussions. They emphasize consent and they provide a safe space for kids to ask all the questions. Right. Scarletine is a website that is a comprehensive online resource for sexual health and education. It offers articles, guides, forums that cover a wide range of topics related to sexuality, relationships, and consent. The content is LGBT. LGBTQ plus inclusive and sex positive. That's awesome. And there's also a maze and they created a lot of videos on their website and it tackles a lot of the aspects of sex ed. It includes puberty, body image and consent and healthy relationships. These videos are specifically designed for young people and they're fun for them. Yeah, they're animated. They're mm -hmm. really cool. Uh, Planned Parenthood, the website there has a wealth of information on sexual health, including educational articles, videos and interactive tools. They offer resources for teens and parents covering topics as puberty, birth control, consent. They also have a full scale sex ed and health curriculum that I've looked at many times. It's super expensive, but it looks really, really great. Yeah. The next one on the list is OWL, O-W-L, stands for Our Whole Lives by the Unitarian Universalist Association. It's their curriculum. And this is a comprehensive, age-appropriate, and inclusive body sex ed program for all age groups, from young children to adults. It's a year-long program, and it covers topics like anatomy, relationships, and consent, and so much more. My daughter did the middle school program, which is the meteor of all the programs and probably the most popular, and we're not even a part of this organization but they let us in it was free it was a great year for us yeah people love owl everyone talks about it I don't think I've ever heard like a negative thing about it and you can get the resources and teach it at home yourself but I think the key to it is that they didn't they include like a lot of they have oh, guest speakers so there's a lot of hands on so like if you can find this class and get your kid into it locally it's so wonderful I have the curriculum right there on my bookshelf oh look at you I do you can borrow it from Maria it's right into the show <laughs> I didn't teach it, though. And as a matter of fact, the parents are not allowed in. It's a safe space for the kids. Oh, nice. Yeah. Nice. So yeah. they can a answer any questions mm -hmm. they want. Yeah. Advocates for Youth, this is also a website. It's an organization that promotes comprehensive sex education. Their website has a lot of resources, lessons plans, fact sheets, toolkits. It's a really great source. Yeah, and then there's also Gender and Sexuality Alliance, the GSAs. If this group is available in your area, they provide a supportive environment for discussions on gender identity, sexual orientation, and other related topics. It's a really safe space for a lot of kids that are in need of this. Yeah, 
Always review the content of resources to ensure that they align with your values and age appropriateness for your child. It's important that you create a safe and non-judgmental space for your child to ask questions and discuss sensitive topics. Open and honest communication is key when you're teaching progressive sexual education. Absolutely. Well, hopefully we've given everyone some ideas on how to include health, PE, and sex ed into their homeschool. What do you I think? I think so, yeah. yeah. We're going to have a lot of links on this one. So, so many resources. Come to, back and yeah. check out the show notes for yeah. sure. Yeah. We'd love to hear your feedback. This is a really important, your kids are going to learn this stuff, whether or not you teach them. So use these tools and set them on the right path. Absolutely. Meanwhile, tune in next week for episode 52. I'm super excited about this one. It's called Keep on Learning, an Education Education Vacation. Vacation. (laughs) See you next time. Bye-bye. Cheers. Be sure to check us out on our website at btdthomeschool.com, as in been there, done that, btdthomeschool.com. You can join our mailing list and get news and updates on future podcasts. And be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform and follow us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, at the BTDT Been There, Done That Homeschool Podcast.